they're going to see this bill next week. <laughs> okay, so usually I walk around when I'm doing presentations. I have never in my life stood behind a podium for presentations. This feels really weird. And if I start moving, it's her job to get me back in front of it. And y'all can go and tell me to like, move. <laughs> okay, so this is humor, the secret ingredient your game can't do without. And I am Suzanne Peterson Ward, and you'll get why that's making me laugh a little bit in two seconds. Two seconds. Okay, maybe this is not gonna. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this presentation was created by me, Suzanne Moore, aka Suzanne Peterson, aka Lily Black. Special thanks to some awesome people that I've learned a lot from. Um, everybody should know who Scott Adams is. Dan Yaccarino created the Backyardigans, if anybody was old enough or young enough to play with them. Um, and Scott Dickers was one of the founders of The Onion, which you may or may not be familiar with, <laughs> but um, political satire, etc. cetera. And, um, and so I've learned a lot and I've studied a lot, and we'll get to that more in a second. And the three names, yeah, that's actually not even all my names. <laughs> I actually have additional. Those are just the main three. And the story there is that when you're an author, which is what my background is as, as an author, then you know you, you get so that there's like niche places that you write or different areas. Or sometimes you're just the kind of person who can't apparently stick to one thing. <laughs> and so when that's the case, you end up with different pseudonyms and you start to not know who you are anymore. <laughs> but, um, and so that is why, you know, cause like as I, my, my legal name is Suzanne Peterson and that was what I edited under when I, I worked for a publisher for a while as a developmental editor and um, that was Suzanne Peterson. And, um, but the rest of everything online, I have Suzanne Moore, that's where I write my um, science fiction and fantasy. And Lily Black was a genre I tried for a little while that didn't really work so just as well, it's under a different name. Um, but yeah, and since the pandemic started and everything kind of went upside down for a little while, I enrolled in Wake Tech's game design program and discovered that I absolutely, absolutely love it. And the huge shocker was definitely the programming. I'm the kind of person that when I was getting my bachelor's degree a long time ago, I planned my path to avoid all the math classes. <laughs> I actually wanted to go pre-med and I, I enjoy human anatomy and I worked on cadavers and ate pizza right after working on them, right? So it was so big. Formaldehyde just adds to the taste. But the, uh, you know, the, the math classes were gonna straight up kill me. Like really honestly, I cannot survive math. I, I just can't, I can't do math. And so I just assumed I couldn't program either because it's all part of that stuff, right? And then it turned out the programming is different from math and among other things, I am just teeny tiny bit dyslexic and I think that probably didn't help with the math because I was flipping numbers sometimes. You, you know, I do everything right, but if you write down the wrong numbers, it still comes out wrong. And uh, that was very annoying. And programming, it doesn't matter as much. Plus, probably my, my writing and editing experiences taught me how to, you know, like I, I edit backwards in order to, like I'll start reading my manuscript backwards in order to deal with the, the flipping things and like, funnel it into the brain differently. Anyway, but, um, and I really, really love animation and I just love everything about game design and I've just discovered this is the coolest, most fun thing ever and I can't believe it was like the best kept secret and now I finally found out about it. So that's what I'm doing and this little image is from the game that I, um, I created my own game this, um, this last semester, this past semester I only had one class and my author responsibilities were like, you know, do nothing for like a month and then like completely pedal to the metal for one month and then do nothing for another month and so in the off times I could work on the game and it was it was a ton of fun it was so much fun it was really cool and this is <laughs> this is the little plug <laughs> that I am a part of the Wake Tech's game jam and yes 
vote for me, vote for me. <laughs> vote for the best game, as long as it's shell break, okay? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and if anybody wants to come and play it, I actually don't really care if I win, and I'm sure I won't, because most of my friends are not on itch.io and don't have accounts, so they're not gonna actually vote. But I would love to have feedback, because I think I might actually turn this into a big real game instead of just a little prototype, and I am loving anybody sharing any thoughts and et cetera, so like, come play the game tomorrow morning. And or play it online. It's like on that little paper that y'all have. So yeah. And but yeah. So going back to the humor thing. So first up, I'm just gonna be straight. Humor when you try to do it deliberately and consistently and integrate it into stuff that you're creating your content is harder than it seems. It it sounds like it'd be so easy. You just have to be funny, right? But it turns out it's not actually. And that is part of why, maybe I'm also a little slow learner with humor, but that was the, that was the, the part of the eight weeks, because it really, you know, it's complicated, and it's hard to do it consistently. But the other reason for eight weeks is because it's really, really important, and it can do so much. It's like the secret power weapon thing that you actually need to be a little bit careful with, but it can do so much for your games. And, and for the content that you're creating. And th these, are, these are some of the, some of the things we're gonna talk about here. Um, making painful subjects bearable, and that um, has a lot to do with understanding your audience, but it doesn't do you a lot of good to understand your audience and understand what they can tolerate and what they can stomach, unless you know how to then deliver that, that level, whatever that level is, right? And so humor can be one of the tools you use to be able to do that. And we'll go into that, but you know, um, helping games shift up and down in intensity, making sure that you have the right kind of characters in there that are gonna be useful, that are gonna help you deliver content. And really kind of the center for a lot of us is building loyalty to your brand and getting people excited about your games because who doesn't want that, right? So, and it is something you can learn. If I can learn it, you guys can learn it. It does not come easily for me, okay? And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I swear you can learn it. <laughs> okay, so this is something a lot of people haven't really thought about, but there really is a very fine line between humor and horror. Like honestly, if you picture any scene, like for example, somebody, you know, I used to watch some like intense sci-fi type stuff and, and things like that, and if you picture somebody that's like a spy that's been, you know, taken in for questioning by the bad guys and they're gonna like pull their teeth, right? That's pretty awful. And those of us, I have a lot of crowns in my mouth <laughs> and I have to do most of them without Novocaine because Novocaine doesn't work well on me. That's painful, right? I can only imagine like an actual extraction without. <laughs> but that can be really funny if you give it the right twist. It's all about how you handle it. You can honestly handle almost anything, any content for any audience, as long as you can kind of hit that emotional resonance level, right? And humor is a really important part of how you do that. And that's, that's kind of like how you take something that could potentially be just, nope, not okay, up here, right? And bring it down to something that your audience can stomach. Similar to this, like, this, the plot of this story, is anybody, I'm mostly you guys are gonna have to like save comments and stuff, but I'm gonna try to go fast because among other things, I know that there are a couple people in the audience that I promised when I was showing my game yesterday, that if you have questions about the writing side of things, I will also answer those after. So I'm gonna try to go fast and then we can answer any questions after. But does anybody know what story I'm talking about? <laughs> you guys are awesome. Okay, just somebody shout it out. Hello. Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And yet when you look at that, and of course I put some tells in there, but if you look at that and you think about it, like that's not, you know, a beloved holiday comedy that everybody pulls out all the time, right? Like we think it's so funny if we leave our kids home and then they have to fend for themselves against people that might slip their throat or something, right? That's hilarious, no. <laughs> but if you handle it right, it is. And that is, that is one of the powerful first things you could do. And part of how you do that is by empowering your, your, your storyline, your narrative, your characters, so that they have a say in it, and a lot of it comes from their perspective, which is part of where this little tip right here, which some of you might have trouble seeing. So the tip says, similarly, game characters can use a bit of sauce or humor to make light of something that would otherwise be super revealing and perhaps 
come across more touchy-feely or exposed than you want them to. So if you've got kind of like, you know, a shooter, first-person shooter type game, which is honestly not the kind of game I play generally. I, right now, I'm, it's a cliche, but I'm completely hooked on Breath of the Wild right now. <laughs> so I'm just straight up skin that I like to need my fill. If I haven't gotten out of the house, I can go into Breath of the Wild, and then I'm okay. <laughs> just got my house. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, so, you know, but if you have something that's supposed to come across as a little more gritty, and, you know, you can't have you have something that you need to reveal, reveal about your character or the, about a situation, and it's it's painful, it's intense, it's tight. You know, it's gonna, it's got to be dealt with. You have to, the 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 um, player requires that you deal with it in some way, right? If you respond to it, and you don't want to not respond to these painful or intense things you put in a game, because if you don't respond in the game, what you're saying, that what you're communicating, is that it doesn't actually matter, because it doesn't impact, right? So it has to have some impact, but you don't want it to go in too sappy, or like, we just jump genres, and now suddenly this doesn't feel like the kind of game I thought I was getting, Having them toss off a funny remark or something like that is part of how you can then take that and kind of hit the tone you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay. And you see the rest of that. Everybody, can everybody even raise your hand in the back if you can see my slides? Okay. Because I don't usually like repeat everything on my slides. I figure you can read that, right? So I'm just going to talk about them. Okay. And this is another thing. <laughs> I don't know who's old enough or retro enough to play the, the Zelda games. But this is a really, really funny moment. And it, so humor is another way that you can take an enemy and just really amp their, their um, what makes them interesting and really kind of change the tone again when including in fight scenes and stuff like that so that you're in control of what you're delivering to the player. And we're going to come back to that a little bit. But that, that, that's a, in case anybody doesn't know, that's you like, it was, I think it was Soraya's song. <laughs> and you play your flute and the, and the grand stops dancing. But we're going to, we're going to save any, start trying to save things mostly. Okay. And another thing, like, I don't know if anybody's a Hollow Knight fan. I, I really love Hollow Knight. It's just an incredibly beautiful game and just so evocative, right? And it's not, when you guys are thinking like, okay, humor, funny stuff, you know, you're going to think of like, Untitled Goose Game, right? You're not going to think of Hollow Knight necessarily, but Hollow Knight actually does a. They they use two things, not just humor. They also use a lot of wonder um, to help lighten the tone a little bit. When I was first told about Hollow Knight, I was like, that doesn't really sound like my kind of game. And besides, like it just sounds like it's going to be too dark. I mean, you know, I, I don't really want to go there. And they're like, no, no, I swear it's not that dark. It's, you know, and I was like, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be. <laughs> and also, I'm a little claustrophobic. I don't know if I want to go underground, right? Well, you don't get any of that from Hollow Knight, right? It feels wondrous and open and it's beautiful. And there's lighter moments throughout. Like, you know, a little dude who just loves making maps. He loves them so much that he's humming. You know, like, I'm not going to do it. But he's humming while he makes them, and he's happy. And it doesn't matter that it's a post-apocalyptic world where everybody's died of a terrible disease that no one can fight off or survive. He's still happy. He's making his maps. It's just like us, game devs. We're just, you know, anyway. But it's like me during the pandemic. It's just still, you know, still kind of there. Anyway. So, yeah. And so moving on to another one of those points. One of the other things that humor can do for your game is just really um, take the emotional tone up and down. And how am I doing? I'm going to need to pull some out so I can keep an eye on the time. Because I have, I always have so much stuff I want to share. Okay, we're doing all right. So, um, so some of you guys may be uh, aware that um, someone's pain threshold can be moved based on the prior pain experiences you've had. So if you have the dentist appointment where you're dealing with your crowns and you don't have Novocaine and it's really painful, and then you step on the tack the next day or a few hours later, I forget how long it is, that tack doesn't hurt as much because your pain threshold will already appear, right? And this is just like a biological thing, okay? And so it's it's guessed or we, we think that it's possible that part of why people come to entertainment is to deal with your stress levels in a similar way. So your tension and your stress levels are here, and you want them here, and you go in and you get stressed out in a game, 
and then you slope down afterwards, and suddenly you can tolerate the tension levels you brought. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that you're trying to do when you deliver really almost any entertainment is you're trying to give somebody an emotional experience in which they feel something, right? They, they feel whatever it is that they came to hit they're looking for when they come to play your game. It may just be a distraction for a couple minutes on a mobile phone because, oh my gosh, this line is taking forever and I don't want to blow my top, right? It may be you know, a, a more deeper immersion experience to get out of their skin or whatever, but you want them to feel something, and humor is one of the ways that you can control that and manage those tension levels. Because otherwise, this slide is very boring. This slide is, this slide is monotonous. This is very monochrome. You do not want your game to flatline. You need contrast. You need contrasting emotions, and humor is one of the ways you can do that. Okay, Just like in Little Nightmares, which I love, but it cannot play very often because it's nightmares. <laughs> okay, and, th and this is another. So um, it's you know a commonly used literary device to put um, someone that we think of very lovingly as too stupid to live in your book because then they can do all the stupid things or ask the stupid questions because, I mean, in Harry Potter, which I mean, this is not knocking anybody, but Ron kind of plays that role, right? They can say the thing, they can, you know, um, they can punch the person that everybody wants to punch and it would be a bad idea, and your sympathetic, smart characters can't do that, but your kind of dumber characters can, right? And that is like what Pippin does, if you think about it. The person who can't not touch it, right? <laughs> and these characters are really useful because they can, they can be an interesting and beloved character as long as they're funny while still doing these stupid things. Because the tricky part is, is if the character is just stupid, then your main characters start to look stupid by association because like, why would you be friends with that person? Don't you realize how dumb they are? You know, <laughs> Why are you letting them get you into trouble all the time? But if they're funny, suddenly they're lovable, they're likable, and they can do, they can entertain us while progressing the plot and or progressing the information. It's one of the places where they're really useful is in delivering information because all Entertainment has some kind of world that usually has some level of transport that's part of getting out of your skin, right? And that it requires the delivering of information, but nobody wants to read an encyclopedia article, nobody wants an info dump, so you need that information delivered in an interesting way, an entertaining way, as part of the entertainment that's keeping immersion, and that means, you know, you have a limited number of options. And we could, afterward, we could talk a little bit, if you guys want to, about some of these other options. Um, like using anger and embarrassment, but those are a little more obvious. Humor is kind of the, the tricky, hard to pin down one, so we're focusing on humor. All right. Yeah, I covered most of this. The Pippin approach. Okay. Yeah, like the moment with the, with the apples. I don't know. If you, like, what about second breakfast? What about eleven Z's? <laughs> what about what else am I going to get to eat? Okay, so it's just very useful to, to have somebody that will ask those questions. I'm going to just move on because we're going to zip through. And again, the going back to our dancing Goron, the um, and any person, if you stop and think about your social interactions, there are almost certainly people that you know that you don't like, but that you tolerate. Or if like you're in a social circle and they're in like in that same social circle and they say something that you don't actually like them for saying, but they're funny in how they say it. You are a thousand times more likely to tolerate it because they were, they, they were funny. They made everybody laugh, right? Than if they said it just straight and it wasn't funny and nobody laughed. And that's not something that I think as a, as a human race we should be proud of necessarily, but it isn't a, a reality. People can sponge dinners off of other people. People can get out of paying rent sometimes. They can get out of all kinds of things as long as they're funny. We find them entertaining, we find them interesting, and we're more likely to tolerate them. And that goes for enemies too. It's a way to make an enemy or a bad guy or anybody in a game more interesting is if you just give them a line that he doesn't even have to be laugh out loud. So it's just amusing, right? Because you like them better after. You can give them a stupid dance. 
Anyway, so the, the next point I want to make is the dedicated players, and we're going to spend some time on this, because whether you, whether you like Big Bang Theory or not, those guys have their tight bunch of buddies and friends, and that's part of what players want. They want to, they want to have that sense of identity. They, they actually, whether they're going to be in person or online, most players are still looking for something that they feel like they can connect with on a deeper level rather than just from moment to moment, you know, and, and feel like it's part of who they are and, 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 and what they do. And, and we, as game developers, want people who will line up for hours and get rained on and so on to play our games. We want people who are loyal. And that's part of what humor can do, and it's really powerful and really cool. And this is how. Because humor, when, when there's y'all are over here and I'm over here, right? We have nothing in common, we don't know each other. Maybe there's clear signs that we're not the same kind of person or something like that. One of us tells a joke, the other one laughs. Suddenly there's overlap, there's a connection between us. We share the same ideas about the world. That's what that says. Humor is based a lot on like knowing where taboos are and knowing how close to that line you can get and whether you cross the line in a funny way or you stay just inside the line or usually it's just outside the line but not too far out the line, it's based a lot on taboos. And so, the, and also on a unique perspective, which is another way of, you can't provide a unique perspective unless you get the world from a similar framework as the people who are going to look at the world with you and, and go, oh, okay, that's funny because I get this framework of the world as well. Are you guys following me? I get nods? Okay. And so that's part of what humor does. And it's it's a double-edged sword because one of the things that it can do is it can create this sense of identity, the insiders, and there's the outsiders out there. And most of us have witnessed that kind of humor too. And I'm just gonna say right now <laughs> that you guys, this is not what you're here to learn, all right? We are not gonna do that. <laughs> that is not part of what this humor presentation is going to do. And some of these links are studying exactly that. Humor is actually used as, like, if you share jokes with somebody else and they laugh at it, then you know that it's safe to broach certain subjects with it. So humor is actually one of the first, um, like, tests that some, like, fringe groups use in order to find out if they can approach you with something a little more hardcore. And that's part of how people become radicalized, believe it or not. That's actually what one of these links is, is too, is a study that studies that. So please don't use humor as a weapon, guys, okay? Just use it to make your games awesome, okay? And the and that is but that is it is it's really pretty incredible what can happen when you take a group of people like coworkers who've been getting on each other's nerves and don't like each other right now at all, and maybe they happily sabotage the other person. And then you get them laughing together and suddenly it's like, oh yeah, my buddy, of course, he's alright. And that's what humor does. Okay. So how do we do this? Check my time. All right, we gotta go fast. <laughs> so the um, I like acronyms and things that help me remember other things. So I'm giving you SQUID, all right? And part of why it's SQUID is because certain sounds are funnier than other sounds, and the ones that make you almost spit are the, are, are, if you can't remember which sounds are funny, you can Google it. But if you can't remember and you can't Google it right then, then just think like a little kid, like little kids that are going around going and they're spitting, right? And the sounds that are like forward and the hard consonant sounds tend to be funnier. So certain sounds just inherently, if you're looking for like a, a word to finish off something and you need a punchline, Go for the hard sounds, hard consonant sounds rather than the soft ones. Or if you want a character to have a funny name, like Pippin, then go for the hard sounds instead of the soft ones, okay? So anyway, so that's why squid. So here's what we're gonna go through real quick. All right, so save the funny bit. There's a reason punchlines are at the end. You need to leave room for people to laugh, and you need to um, kind of finish with your, your knockout like final boom, now we're done. Because that's just funnier to people, okay? And then queasy quacks are quickest. That's just partly the alliteration again. Partly, I mean, these are tools that sometimes you might be like, 
that just sounds kind of lame. I'm, I'm not doing any dad jokes or alliteration. It gets a bad rap. I'm just, you know. Well, I'm just saying that if you need something and you want to make it funnier, these are tools that are available to you, okay? Um, and that's the other reason is because queasy quacks is just a ridiculous, stupid thing to say, right? It is kind of fun to say, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of silly. And silly can be good. A lot of times, whatever it is that you have, a, you think of it, and then you're like, no, that's just dumb, and you want to pull back. That's because you're pulling back into your comfort zone. What you want, if you're crying, going for funny, is get outside your comfort zone. Okay? So you don't, you don't want to. When it, when it seems too dumb, go ahead and bounce it off of other people, hopefully in a safe environment or something like that and see how they react. And you might find that what you were like, nah, a little embarrassed by, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious, okay? So anybody have any thoughts on that? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go on to the next slide so you can, you can see it. <laughs> There's my Breath of the Wild reference. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, that's a game problem, right? Every, every game almost, okay, all right, not all of them, but almost every game has, you know, you need an ammo upgrade or you need more bags in your WoW, you know, because getting more bags back when I used to play WoW was a big deal. <laughs> you need somewhere to carry your stuff, you need somewhere to store your stuff, etc. You need someone to provide that, right? So how, why not, you know, <laughs> this really strange dancing Baraka guy with broccoli on his head because that is pushing it out there is so silly is so ridiculous that it actually works in a game that is otherwise fairly straight it provides a light moment and it gives you that like juicy happy feedback like yay you win right okay so going on through it <laughs> what's with the underwear well first of all everybody see do you hear that the little chuckles as soon as somebody says underwear, the room goes tee. And that's true even if it's like really old, very buttoned up librarians, or if it's six year olds that are like, this is the funniest day of my life because somebody just said underwear from the pulpit, from the, you know, podium thingy. The, and so, you know, that's part of that taboo, right? And that's part of the, um, knowing where the line is and knowing whether you can cross it or not. And the tricky part is that what is taboo depends on a person. It's, it's individual, which is part of why humor does create these ins and outs. So it can be a little tricky. You need to know your audience well. And it's probably better to try to choose humor that, um, <laughs> that doesn't go too far outside because you can really you know, end up alienating a lot of your audience instead of making them laugh and that's the tricky part but it's helpful to know certain things like underwear are funnier right i know him so i'm gonna give him a bad time later <laughs> did i mention a black belt <laughs> anyway <laughs> he's good he played my game a lot yesterday so it's, it's forgiven anyway um so yeah the the um Knowing where those tab taboos are, but just knowing you don't have to push the taboo line as long as you know that you're kind of going to play with it and where, how to explore it, if that makes sense. Okay, inject a little honesty. Okay, so what happened just there, I'm just going to go ahead and use that experience. The truth of the matter is, it's embarrassing to the presenter when somebody gets up in the middle and leaves. You're like, oh, no, I'm being boring, right? And you all know that, and everybody here saw him leaving, right? And so dealing with it is by kind of acknowledging it sideways, right? And just going, yeah, um, I'm not really cool with people leaving in the middle of my presentation. And that's part of where you can like, the honesty can actually be really funny because everybody knows it. And now you point it out, there's an elephant. <laughs> it's right in the middle of the room. So that's, you know, it, you have to begin, you have to be a little bit careful because you don't want to go around telling people truths that are actually just being cutting and you're turning into a bully and that's what you're really doing, right? But a little honesty under the right circumstances is a really good thing. And I think, I forgot one of the tips. I'm going to actually sit backwards to read it. Um, so to cover that. So that is one of those things. My rule that I feel like is just kind of a general, it's my rule, but 
probably the world would be a better place if everybody adopted it, so hint, hint, <laughs> is if it's not yours, you don't get a laugh at it. If it's not a part of who you are and your identity, it's probably not cool for you to laugh at it, right? So, for example, I have a daughter with a connective tissue disease who has serious health challenges. She and I laugh together a lot of times about all kinds of stuff. Like, if she's having to get IVs, I've taken a picture of her with her, she's drinking her water bottle, and she's getting IVs at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you think you were for keeping getting your hydrating, you know, doing a good job drinking water. You're only doing it one way. <laughs> she can do it two ways. If, you, if she gives them the other arm and I tip up the bottle, she can do it three times at once, you know? That's something we can laugh at because that's, that's ours, right? But if somebody else starts making fun of my daughter, <laughs> that's when you really find out in the black belt. <laughs> so if it's not yours, leave it alone. Someone else can handle that material and handle it knowing where the taboos are, right? All right, so we're gonna sit back up. You guys are being awesome. Oh, yes, okay. And then finally, all right, poor Dumbledore. <laughs> Here we go, yeah. So, <laughs> Dumbledore drops his drawers. Okay. <laughs> so maybe, I, I write for kids, so maybe this is one of those, like, I'm okay with this tattoo, maybe y'all aren't. But to me, that's funny. And it goes last because it is funny. So hopefully when you think of squid and you're trying to remember how to be funny and you go through them, right? And you're trying to remember, oh, there's those, those stupid cues and then, oh yeah, and then there was the, the honesty thing and Jack's honesty and oh yeah, Dumbledore drops his drawers. I'll bet you remember that and it goes last because that's one of these simple basic things are one of the most crucial things for, for writing something funny. If you're, if you're putting, a little bit of dialogue into a game. And it seems so easy until you're actually trying to write that dialogue and suddenly you sound like you have never written anything in your life. Like a kindergartner can do it better, right? And in fact, you should hire kindergartners, I'm just kidding. But, and that's when it's helpful to have these kind of tools in the back of your brain because you write something out, just get something down. That's one thing, as, a, as an author, I can just tell you guys, just get it down. If it's terrible, that's what editing is for, just try again. Right? But if you don't get anything down, you can't edit it. You shouldn't put anything down yet, right? So just get it down and then edit it. And part of the editing process is running through squid and kind of going, okay, did I use some funny sounding words? Did I put the funny part last? Oh crap, it's in the middle. And then you'd have to like rearrange your sentence to put it in the and put it at the end, right? Okay. So do we have time for this? How long do I have? Till five thirty, right? Okay, I have pens and papers. You guys are actually a little bit bigger group than I thought I was going to get. Hey! <laughs> so, so if you already have writing utensils, so so my sweet husband, who's awesome and amazing, and he's a patent attorney, so I'm already covered. It's pretty awesome. But he's going to pass out to anybody who needs it. So don't just just wait until they raise their hands, huh? Yeah. yeah. And we're just going to take a few minutes. While he's passing these out, take a look at the prompts. And um, these are common problems, right, that games deal with. And if you've created a game, odds are you've probably come across one of these. Even my little teeny tiny game has actually dealt with people poking around. I'm like, that's not where you're supposed to go. <laughs> Couldn't you see I was breadcrumbing, leaving you over there? <laughs> And you know, if the bigger the game, I think the more you deal with these types of things. So we're just gonna take a couple minutes and just try. It's okay, just brainstorm. You can't fail with this, all right? But you don't have to start yet. He's still passing me out. And while he is, okay. So don't worry about like word count. Don't worry about, you know, you're not turning this into your English teacher. This is just you and a piece of paper, brainstorming is my biz. Remember, there's nothing, yeah, go ahead. Like no, nah. this like is whatever like you need that's going to be useful to you. So just brainstorm stuff. And second? just remember, no idea is too ridiculous. Yeah. What was the second Oh, I'm going to actually, here you go. Um, I, won't start, I won't start our time yet, but yeah. So does that give you enough of a prompt or do you need me to go back? Okay. So just basically the prompts are that the, if the players 
are poking around where they don't belong. They're trying to, you know, they're not trying to break your game. Okay, maybe they are, but they're trying to find out where they can go, right? Like, how can you get them back where you want them without patronizing them or annoying them or turning them off of your game, right? Because sometimes those players can be the most devoted players if they think they're having fun. And second is, of course, delivering world information, which is, it's really, really tricky. I mean, the only way you could just pop up a UI constantly in front of the player the whole time telling them exactly what they're supposed to do, right? Only you can't. So <laughs> delivering world information, or like, and that includes um, like how to play, you know, questing type stuff, anything at all the player needs to know, and you've got to try to give it to them and deliver it to them in a way that's interesting. So just, just brainstorm, try to kind of go back to squid, whatever, if, if something comes to mind and it's your, your like go-to thought, go ahead and go with that and then iterate on it and improve on it and see what you can come up with. And we're just going to take like, like five to ten minutes. So can I get a show of hands right now if anybody thinks after they're done that they're the kind of person who might like to share it and discuss it a little bit? So we got a couple of brave souls. The rest of y'all, <laughs> you're more like me. I get that. <laughs> All right, but we probably won't um, because it takes more time, and I want to give you guys more time to work on it. It's more important that you get to a place that you're happy with the kinds of ideas you came up with. So ready, set, go. <laughs> Y'all look at me. I'm not going to give you the answers. <laughs>
tricky part where I'm like counting heads. How many are still bent over working on it and how many heads are up? Somebody in the back, but I'm just gonna tell you guys right up because it's gonna come up in Q&A anyway. I have a very minor hearing impairment, so you, can have to, you guys might have to relay the message from the back of the room. And it's not in the normal register, it's in the bottom register. I made some stupid decisions as a teenager. Yeah. And so men's voices, I'm not being selectively mean. Men's voices tend to sit on the line. So you're looking at the pretend you're wearing really tight underwear and pitch up in order for me to hear you as a guy. <laughs> Somebody just said something funny, but I didn't catch it. Genders <laughs> only. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Your falsetto works too. <laughs> and I know how hard it is to talk through a mask. I usually am wearing one, so yeah. Believe it or not, one of my you know, moments of the pandemic was last summer delivering a funeral address through a mask. Luckily, I didn't like anybody in the audience anyway. <laughs> oh, that was a joke, yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna call it. I'm very sorry to people who are still madly writing. Hopefully that showed you, um, just I'm gonna put in like a little tiny plug for like a writing. I'm not, I'm not actually plugging this presentation because I'm not doing it anywhere, but be aware that like, giving yourself a very tight couple of minutes, really tight, a few minutes to write something and writing just really fast, every idea that comes into your head is a great way to like get past your self-editor, get past you know um, the boring thoughts or the boring like first thing on the shelf type ideas that come to you and get some content out faster and give you some really juicy ideas anyway. So that's, I do like a whole flash fiction thing sometimes that I, you know, I actually did that for I think I saw Max somewhere. He's in my game dev club. Yeah, Max. So he's probably heard it. But anyway, that's that's just another a little tip there. Yeah, comment. Delivering world information. You're going to a cave, a cave that is thousands of years old. Some people say the cave is haunted by a ghost. So if you see one, please do not disturb. We don't want to wake the up the ghost. Not that they sleep anyway. So Max, I could not hear you very well. What I could hear was awesome, right? <laughs> but I am going to, is anybody else, does anybody want feedback on theirs really quickly before we go to Q&A? Is yours, is yours a feedback or is it Q&A? Uh, feedback. Okay. <laughs> we'll do a couple minutes of feedback before we go to Q&A. Go ahead. Okay, but remember, pitch up, especially since you've got a mask on. Sorry, I'm very sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. When the player folks around where they should not be, they would encounter an NPC that looks like they're working on an animation for it. Looking at the player in response, whoa, hey there, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. But wait, I'm not supposed to be here either. We should both get back to what we're doing before we get into real trouble. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's great. Because, you know, that's one of those things that's really fun is, is like just taking the expectation and giving it that little twist, you know? Like, we've all been told to go back or we're not supposed to, right? <laughs> All right, is there anybody else before we, yeah, I, okay, let's see. We will do, <laughs> sorry guys, I can't manufacture more time. We'll do like, just like three more, okay? So the middle right here, and then whoever can pitch their voice up the best of the rest. <laughs> Competition, <laughs> go ahead. So you're going, uh to a, uh, an area and you go off track and you see it's like a, like, it's an old man's house, old man's lawn. It seems like you're, you're about to get in trouble. So it, and as you go in, and nothing really happens, but once you go out, you see the old man and he starts lecturing you. He starts yelling at you. There's a 50 50 chance that he starts lecturing you, ah, get out of my lawn, or uh, scares you away, essentially. Right. I love it. And old people are never grumpy, right? <laughs> All right, somebody in the back. Yeah. So, a player, a player is poking around. Caleb, you'll be next. <laughs> Go ahead, in the corner first. Okay. A player is poking around the 
first area and suddenly decides to start demolishing blocks. You search for a chest. Suddenly, a creature pops out of the ground and smacks the character backwards. It says with an annoyed facial expression, Hey, don't you go through the trespass on someone's property? I will sue you in the court. <laughs> That's fabulous. All right, Caleb, you're up. Okay, so you're going to Wait, this... Caleb, up the voice a little bit. Sorry, hon. You're going to this town, and uh, it looks really shady. And this guy suddenly says, Boy, Mozo, don't keep your wallet hanging out of your pocket. It's deep down. I could have snatched you four times already. You're messing with my rehab. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, and just so you guys know, see, I know Caleb's name because he came and played my game yesterday. <laughs> he even got bragging rights and a prize. All right, <laughs> just a little plug there. Anyway, okay, I think that has to be it for the feedback. You guys are awesome, and I hope you've seen how powerful this can be and what this can do for you, right? So, do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, for humor? Um, You're doing great with your voice. <laughs> Can you tell? Yeah, that's up for you. Good job. Um, for humor? Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my words. Um, uh, yeah. So when it comes to humor, how would you make um, a character who kind of acts more like the, um, the straight man? That is a good question. Um, I'm going to be straight up. I'm going to make this up on the fly and just give you my best guess. Okay. okay. Um, so I think you're kind of talking about someone who's going to act like a foil, right? Yeah. So I would probably say, think about which of the, do you guys know what, <laughs> I always forget when I'm like, I'm used to speaking to audiences that already have like a ton of experience writing, right? Do you guys know about telling details? So, so basically, okay, the telling detail about me today is that I have these really actually very cool silver dragon earrings in. The rest of my outfit is kind of boring. But because I got to come to a game dev conference, and so even though I'm trying to look professional, I have dragon earrings. They're really cool. That's the telling detail, okay? So, so when, you, when you create characters, you give them telling details. I would probably say make sure that your straight man's, um, everything about him, is playing off of and accenting the telling details of the person you're kind of trying to play off of. You're trying to play up those contrasts. And then probably make sure that you spend just as much time on the straight man's dialogue and everything else as the other guys. They're gonna they're gonna kind of act like a duet. Yeah, that's my answer. Next question. Okay. Really? Nobody? Okay. Um, Wait. Sorry. With the relativity, yeah. relativity mm -hmm. of the you know the humor, mm -hmm. uh, very relative. Audience, uh, when you're navigating type of taboos, uh -huh. um, did you have, have you uh, noticed that you have to do a bunch of research for different? Uh, I mean, how do you go about? Did you have to just kind of uh, yeah, no, you, research you, what you're going for before you dive in? Because that, yeah. I used to, for my other life, before this, I was also an author. Oh, cool. I would write uh, my villains were always very humorous but also not the kind of humor that's supposed to be universally, like on right. purpose, cringe right. bad. Like, right. But funny to them, which right. makes them more villainous. Right. And I just realized that I'm supposed to be, I just remembered I'm supposed to be repeating the question because then the audio picks it up better. So, um, so the question is basically about like respecting the taboos and knowing where the line is and how to kind of like find that line. Because that is probably the trickiest part about humor, right? because some people are just not going to find it funny or they're going to just really be upset about what you do. And so the, I think, yes, knowing your audience is the, probably the number one. Well, actually, you know, I'm going to just back it up. The number one thing is don't turn into a bully because that is the easiest kind of humor is to pick on somebody else, right? But please don't turn into a bully. So that's the number one. The next is definitely know your audience. And the thing is, the more you play with it, the better you'll get at finding um, a way to express what you have to say more universally. Because you can, you, you'll start to break it down and realize this is funny for these kinds of reasons. Kind of like with, with Squid, okay? It's funny because, because I 
um, I used honesty in it. Well, there's probably a way to, if you're worried that your, that your line is here and you're out here, and that means you're going to have an audience of three people and you want to sell to more people than that, <laughs> then you can, you can analyze why is that funny to me? Why is that funny for these people? And now how can I make that just a little more universal so that I have a larger pool of people that will find that funny and I'm closer to their taboo place? So yeah, that's my advice on that. Um, in the corner right here. This is a super random question, but what's the funniest joke you've written? That I've read? Written. Like that, the one that you wrote. Oh, I don't actually write um, jokes. <laughs> I exactly. thought you said you were a writer. Yeah, <laughs> but I write fantasy, oh. and um, you know, there's there's funny stuff in there. Like, I hope it's funny, right? <laughs> but I don't. I'm not like actually writing jokes usually. And to be perfectly honest, this is you know uncomfortable moment for me. But I don't actually feel like I'm very good at being funny in my writing. I feel like I have to work really hard at it because my stuff tends to be I have something to say, and it's something that's important to me. And I love fantasy, and I love my story, and I just go, you know, all intense into it. And then I'm like, oh, I just hit them over the head with a giant sledgehammer. And they didn't actually enjoy that. So I have to, like, kind of, for me, the humor often is something I have to go back and layer in, you know, on the, on the next next time through, is kind of go in. And, and it usually has to do with pointing out the ridiculous in scenarios and situations, because I guess that's what's funniest to me. Like, yeah, sorry, I think we've done her. Was it a really quick follow-up? Yeah, just what is the funniest joke you've heard or read? Oh, gosh, I don't know, sweetie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funny things I heard recently is that you can know an American abroad because they say honey and sweetie and stuff. And I just recently read about that. Also, apparently wear a lot of white socks. I'm not wearing white socks. <laughs> but the, and now I'm catching myself, I think at least three times during this q and I said honey or sweetie. <laughs> anyway, yeah, over here in the corner. Who's your favorite comedy author? Somebody else help me. It was too muffled, but a little too low. Who's your favorite comedy, comedy author? author? Oh, Terry Gratchett. Yes. I, was, and, I mean, you know, some people might yes. call him funny, but if so, you have no sense of humor. <laughs> I have read at least 15 to 20 of his books. If I could die and come back as somebody else, I would come back as Terry Gratchett. He is awesome. <laughs> and if anybody ever finds any great merc for Discworld, especially anything having to do with luggage or vines or death, <laughs> death in Discworld, <laughs> I, I just tell me about it. Okay, sorry. Anyway, little fan moment. <laughs> All right, next question. Yeah. Um, just because it's kind of culturally cool. Wait, pitch your voice up. Kind of good. Are you, because it's relevant to the question, mm -hmm. do you, have you watched like all Marvel movies? Like, are you a Marvel fan? as of recently, like MCU and stuff like that? All the Marvel stuff? Yeah, that have, you asked? have you watched the MCU movies? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, just because it's relevant to yeah. my question, have you, because I've, I feel like I've personally seen it, have you seen that kind of like, very frequent humor kind of creep into other genres of, because like in the DC movies, specifically in some of the older ones, it's like, wow, really so really here's where I'm going to get into trouble because any conversation in which DC and Marvel are compared is embarrassing for DC. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I, I'm I, sorry. I, uh, so I, 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 I mean, that, that kind of brand of like quippy, I'm being mean to you, or off the cuff, have you, as an author, I'm not personally an author, have you seen that kind of yeah. dig its roots into other yeah. mediums? So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to repeat your question really quick. Okay. So so you have to stop your question. <laughs> no, okay. So I think you're asking me like basically where I'm seeing Marvel has done a fantastic job with like a whole bunch of uh, movies. I mean you can like them or not, but they've revolutionized things, right? And you're asking me if I've seen that kind of humor kind of permeating outward into other things. Uh, and this is where I have to admit I don't watch a lot of things that are Marvel. <laughs> I mean honestly, I'm trying to think. I mean, I watched all their TV shows, and I don't watch a lot of TV, and I haven't caught a lot of movies since the pandemic. I honestly can't, and this is embarrassing. I don't think I've watched anything but Marvel for like several years. <laughs> I'm really sorry. That is very embarrassing. Okay, I'll go home and do my homework. Okay. <laughs> um, was 
I thought I saw somebody. Was it you? Well, I was just doing a fist bump because I'm a Marvel fan too. Oh, okay, okay. I, I love Spider-Man. Yeah, well, you know, I try not to be. This is just a little thing, like, you know, we shouldn't be consuming just one genre, right? We should be learning from everything, and we should be exposing ourselves to all kinds of stuff. You know, one of the best ways to grow is to pick whatever it is you really can't stand and don't understand why everybody else is nuts about it, and then go analyze and figure out why they are, they like it, what they're doing right, right? But, so that's a little bit embarrassing, but, <laughs> but I don't watch a lot of TV anyway, all right? That's my excuse. Why would I watch a TV when I play a game? Hurry to book. Are there any last questions? I think we're about out. Yeah, over here in the corner. Um, for the, uh, the thing that you set up, uh, squid that's supposed to help, uh -huh. like, kind of come up with how to, like, I guess, like, loosen a really... It's supposed to kind of jog your brain about the sort of guidelines or... Yeah. yeah. Um, have you, like, watched anything or read anything where you're like, that it kind of follows, like, the same format and, like, are there anything that you can think of that's like, okay, it worked in this scenario, but it kind of fell flat in this scenario? That's a really good question. So for the tape, um, speaking of squid, which I came up with squid, so, but those are humor principles that apply everywhere. Um, have I seen uh, uh, examples where that's either used really well or it's used not well? Well, to be honest, I mean, since we were talking about Marvel movies and stuff like that, last lines of certain kinds of media content, like books or a movie, are like the hardest things in the world because now you've said everything you have to say, it's time to shut up, but you need to finish on a strong last line, right? And you want to somehow, with that last line, put everything you've said into a nutshell awesome package and deliver it in a way that leaves somebody feeling something so they'll come back and buy your next thing, right? Oh, oh I mean, so they'll love your material and be touched in their heart. <laughs> anyway, so honestly, the very first Avenger, Avengers movie, um, it was it just Avengers, guys? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you, know, uh, you know, what is it, he his shawarma line? Anybody up for shawarma? What's the, what's the line, and I'm mispronouncing that, There's sorry guys. There's a shawarma joint down the road, I don't know what it is, and I've never been to it, but I want to try it out. Right, that line is, it, that is just, I mean, everybody laughs after that line, because, again, it's one of those, like, it, it, it inverts your expectation. You're expecting something feel good, maybe, because they just had a, a moment where they won their battle and stuff like that, and they, you're, you also are expecting, you know, I mean, he just got, really beat up, right? I mean, most people would be kind of groaning or like, oh, can somebody count my bones? I need to make sure they're all still here or something, right? And they just really invert your expectation and they do it in a way that actually encapsulates the whole point of Avengers really, really well if you think about it because what that's saying is this is just our job. This is our daily life. This is who we are. It's just like somebody around the water cooler after a day's work saying, Hey, you want to go check out, you know, the new taco place that I've heard about? You know, it's Taco Tuesday, guys. And it's it's that kind of like if you really know what you have to say and you know the theme and the message and the point and all of everything else, then that then those then then the, the humor should be able to kind of like encapsulate that and punch it further. And that's kind of what that line does. And I think that's part of why it's so funny. And and it does, it delivers on that, like on the Dumbledore drops his drawers, in that obviously it's not, you know, saying something silly and stupid like that, right? But it is a last line kind of encapsulating and sort of putting the lid on top of everything that came before because it does, because it's so blase, we're just superheroes and this is what we do, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that's a really good example. Now, I'm not going to go into bad examples too much, but I absolutely hate Batman versus Superman. I hate it so much. And I could go for a long time about how much of that doesn't work, but I'm not supposed to run things down and also we, yeah, I think we're out of time. So thank you guys, you were awesome, you were fantastic. Go out and get some